we are doing something a bit different today. As someone who has taken interest in the topic of proposed desert societies, such as the city of Tolosa in the American Southwest, or the Line Project in Saudi Arabia, I do think there is a lot to be discussed about water procurement and water management. To discuss some of my thoughts, I created a city in City Skylines to draw a few parallels and to explain my rendition of the concept. Some of the things I wanted to talk about are not exactly possible to do in City Skylines without certain expansions or mods, so we're going to play pretend a little bit. Thankfully, the game does have a certain amount of flexibility compared to the real world, so as I go along, I should be able to take some liberties here. On that note, let's get started. We have here a map with a river running through a valley, surrounded by mountains on all sides. We don't want to use the water in the river, because it will never be enough to satisfy our population. Instead, we want to import water from the ocean, run it through a desalination medium, and utilize it for human consumption. This is similar to plans like those recently announced by the U.S. state of Arizona, whose municipal governments have planned to deploy a pipeline for importation of desalinated water from Mexico. However, we can take this a few steps further. First things first, we can dump all of the desalinated water into a reservoir at a higher elevation, and then run it through turbines to a lower elevation to generate electricity, thus recapturing some of the energy that was used to transport and desalinate the water. This is similar to the water battery or kinetic battery concept that is being explored in real life as a means to store kinetic input during periods of low electrical demand, and to release it as electrical output during periods of high electrical demand. Additionally, we can place wind turbines and solar panels above the dam to leverage the high wind speeds and ample sunlight found at these higher elevations. Layering solar panels above the reservoir's water supply also has the added benefit of preventing evaporative losses to the fresh water we spent so much money and energy purifying through desalination. While about two-thirds of the water we pull from the sea is going directly into our desalination system and the reservoir, you can see how a portion of it is being redirected down into the valley. We are using that seawater for marine aquaculture, growing specialty crops like various seaweeds and kelps and perhaps some shellfish and other fish species as well. We can cycle that seawater back into the desalination system at our leisure, so all of that water being used gets double counted. Pretty cool, right? However, there is one drawback to this scenario. When seawater is drawn to the valley for aquaculture, there will incur some evaporative losses over time. As a result, the salt concentration will increase. And when it goes to be desalinated, there is a chance that not all of the salt will be removed. Therefore, the use of supplementary purification systems at later stages in the water transportation system will need to be used to ensure maximum water purity prior to it being collected in the municipal drinking water system, as shown here. That said, once the desalinated water is in the municipal water system, it's no different than water which might have been taken from the nearby river. That means if there is more water being produced than the city can use, we can always just run it through a spillway, and it will go into the existing river for other cities to make use of downstream. Either way, it's a win-win. Now, since we are on the topic of master planning a city, I want to take some time to explain a few other things outside of the water concepts. For starters, this project alone took me over 20 hours to get right, and it really demonstrated how master plan cities simply will never go according to plan. This is nothing against cities like Tolosa or The Line, but as I was building this out, it reached a point where I did my phase one and let the simulation go for a bit, 
only to find that successive phases would need to be extensively modified the further I built out, to accommodate for things like differences in terrain, distances from essential services, differences in traffic patterns due to different industries being more or less prevalent, and so forth. Notably, the cargo airport in this map was the first major logistical building I constructed, long before any other building in the city was built. This was done to optimize the transport of goods from outside the region to bring those goods to the major industrial area, which in this case is the aquaculture area on the other side of the motorway. You can see this cargo airport also supports a rail line, which is quite clever, isn't it? However, I did not anticipate how truck freight would still represent the overwhelming majority of motorway traffic. While truck traffic from the airport to the aquaculture fields is handled by two different expressways, all truck traffic from the interstate is being funneled into this central motorway, which has double purpose of connecting downtown with the farthest neighborhoods of the city. You can see how the interchanges are a bit funny, but this was the best way I could think to optimize it. I am sure that an actual civil engineer could come up with something far better. That said, as I was laying down the groundwork for the central motorway, I did notice room available to run a cycling road along the full span of the motorway. Since I set administrative policies to encourage cycling, this approximately 4 kilometer or 2.5 mile stretch of cycling road sees some impressive traffic levels and significantly reduces the need to use passenger vehicles. It is something I want to incorporate in future city designs within city skylines, just to see how far I can take it. Some of you may have also noticed the extensive use of monorail lines connecting some of the outer areas of the city with downtown. I did this because the city of Tolosa plans to incorporate monorail and nothing against the master plan, but I discovered the hard way just how difficult monorail is to implement. I didn't realize that monorail stations are so incredibly, incredibly loud. They have some of the highest noise pollution of any form of public transport in city skylines. Therefore, my districts had to be staggered in a way that the louder commercial and office buildings served as literal sound walls to block urban residential buildings from being adversely affected. Not to mention that even in doing all of this, only 10% of my population ever used monorail on a consistent basis. Most people instead walked or biked the two and a half miles from one end of the city to the other, unless extenuating circumstances required them to use a passenger car. Having played city skylines for hundreds of hours, I have found that trams have the same or even higher adoption rates, and they also cost a lot less than monorail does. They are also far less cumbersome to build cities around. Again, I am not an engineer by any stretch, but if I were designing a city, I think monorail would be one of the last options I would consider, especially when the city is already small enough to be walkable. Speaking of which, you can see that in my neighborhoods, there are a lot of pedestrian-only pathways within city blocks. This allows city blocks to be far longer than what you would see in traditional American cities, further discouraging car use. All in all, those were the main design concepts I worked with on this project. I am probably going to start over and utilize what I learned in this project to create a 2.0 version, so if you would like to see that, let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching.